Good morning, everybody. Uh, I am here to talk about uh, some things that people don't normally talk about, like the sociology of data and history, because I think that there's not nearly enough history in things. And so the title of the talk is Perception is Key, because one thing that we seem not to recognize in our industry in particular is that technology changes perception and it changes your views. And so you have to understand what technology does to you in order to use it to do things to other people. And in the data world, we're using data to do things to other people. And so, oops. Uh, I want to start also with an important aspect of that, and that's framing. And what I mean by framing is the words that you use to frame a subject and discuss it. If you do framing incorrectly, you end up in arguments and people talking past each other. You have bad assumptions about how data gets used. You have inappropriate features because you think you're talking about the same thing and you're not, and so you build the wrong features into a product or into a user interface. And if you think about bad framing, a great example, and it's something that happens over and over again, is the horseless carriage. Right? This is an actual horseless carriage. And when you use words like horseless carriage, you're using the lens of the past to describe something that's going on now. And what that does is it carries connotations and baggage. And that connotation and baggage that you bring with you subtly changes the discussions, and you end up continuously building. There are many examples of horseless carriages just like this. You build the, these things because you haven't thought the problem through. It's just like a carriage, only without a horse. And so the steering mechanisms, the braking mechanisms, which make absolutely no sense in a vehicle like this, haven't been designed in because people thought, well, you just you know, grab that thing, pull it back, and steer it the way uh, the horse would steer it if the horse were driving. And so, um, oh, here we go with the clicker. Can somebody advance that, please? Uh, right now, we're dealing with a lot of bad framing and bad verbiage around big data, which itself is a bad frame, because big data makes it seem like the things that it's all about are big and data, which are partially, but not entirely true. And it leads to a lot of misunderstandings, and it also leads to people trying to put product onto market in certain ways that are kind of unpleasant. And uh, as a receiving person, as a consultant, as somebody who works in IT, I get frustrated with a lot. Now, big data is unprecedented is one of my favorite because immediately that casts it as a there's precedent and there isn't, and so this is something brand new, which means that it's totally disruptive. And the thing is, there's a long evolution of computing technology and data processing. And that evolution is really a history. And there's a difference between inventing something new out of whole cloth and improving on something that was there before, or more likely, rediscovering something that you didn't know about from 15 years ago. And so when you have no past, you're inventing, and it's potentially very disruptive to do this. Now, when you actively reject your past, you're being a teenager, and you're essentially... Um, somebody advance the slide, please. Uh, you're, you're essentially arguing over the wrong things. Now, one of the, the key things to know about technology is there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Technologies aren't perfect replacements for each other. Um, they're different. Even when you do something as simple as taking your SQL Server database and replacing it with Oracle, there are enough differences there to make it an unpleasant task. Now, when you have something that's different, like, say, NoSQL databases, and you try to replace a relational database with it, you're making a whole lot of trade-offs, and they're trade-offs you don't realize you're making. And we have a long, long history in this industry of doing exactly that. I think in part because unlike metal, unlike machinery, it's not lying around in the field when you're done. The bits just disappear and you don't know they exist anymore and you can never fiddle with the old bits because they're either DRM'd, copyrighted, or you don't have the hardware to run them anymore. 
That leads to trade-offs that you didn't expect and unintended consequences. And this is one of those great examples of unintended consequences. Radium. You know, people had fluoroscopes and all sorts of things and were radi radiating themselves constantly back in the 40s and 50s. Um, so we have here some radium lozenges. Uh, I like the radium lozenges because they have the energy of radium and the strength of iron. Um, there's the Thor Radia. Now, I have a whole series of these posters uh, of the same woman, but what you'll notice if you squint is that in every single poster, her head looks like an atomic cloud. And the third one is probably the most interesting one because I think it actually works, and that's these rubber prophylactics, Nutex, radium Nutex. <laughs> so you have radium-treated condoms. Now, out of these three things, I think only one might have the effect that you really hope for, but that's one of the problems of not being able to anticipate or look forward, and sometimes there's good reasons, like the fact that we didn't really understand a lot about radiation before we started using it, but also you have things that um, you just haven't thought about, because when you actively reject the past, you immediately take everything that something you don't like is and mark that as bad. Right? This is how you end up with religious debates about various topics where people just shout at each other and the person who shouts the loudest wins. So I have here the history of databases. Now, I've condensed this down from 1970 to make it a little bit easier to understand. But uh, the quick run-through is in 1970, we didn't have SQL. Right? We had IMS, we had multi-value databases. Uh, things called MongoDB and Cassandra, if you're familiar with multi-value databases, and IMS. Um, in 1980, SQL databases existed. Now, SQL didn't get standardized until 1986, but at that point, you really needed to know SQL. In 2000, everybody was using sharded MySQL, who was anybody? If you weren't, you weren't anybody, so you probably, now you know. Um, in 2000, uh, people started using memcache to try and front-end stuff and build the application against that tier rather than trying to you know, deal with this relational database because agile development doesn't fit well with a relational database model because of how you have to develop. Uh, there are latencies involved, there are complexities involved, and there's a pure scalability problem because the logic of a lot of MySQL development goes, MySQL doesn't scale to the level I need, therefore, all relational databases don't scale, which is sort of like the, uh, the logician sketch, if you're familiar with that. Um, basically, you come home, you've forgotten your anniversary, and your wife says, you don't love me anymore. Um, well, so no SQL, that was out. But then people realized that, oh, we actually need joins. We actually need to link data together. Maybe we do need SQL. So, but we'll call it not only SQL, and that'll cover things up. So we have Hive with HQL, and Cassandra with CQL, and everybody's got their XQL. And then in 2013, this year, we end up back where we started. We've come full circle, because Google published a paper last year called, you know, on Spanner, something they've been working on for a while. And there's a number of databases out there built along these same principles, and F1. If you download and read those papers, what you will find is that Google where 96% of the revenue comes from AdWords, is now running AdWords on an ACID-compliant, um, strict schema SQL database called F1. And so we're back to know we actually did mean SQL. So maybe these aren't the databases we're looking for. Now, if we look at the history, this is sort of the quick history. Um, compressed onto this slide, the Spanner F1 piece that has sort of ended up, you know, kind of at the tail end here, is interesting, but along the way, there was a lot of different stuff. We experimented. Now, I came onto the scene as databases were standardizing, and I learned SQL and relational model after dealing with record management systems and hierarchical databases, and it was a really unpleasant task because of all of the edge cases. Concurrency edge cases, synchronization, trying to get consistent data, blocking transactions. Now, we've solved a bunch of things in the uh, NoSQL world because we've actually dropped transactions and we have eventual consistency and we have all of these things which mean that everything the database did for you now gets pushed into your own program. Now, that's 
great, except that now you have lots and lots of edge cases in your code. And edge cases are the thing that kill you because they're usually 80% of any system. And so you go back to the beginnings and we have hierarchical databases. We have codicil databases. We have uh, uh, multi-value databases like PIC. Now, if any of you are old mainframe programmers who worked with PIC or IMS or Adabase, you guys are cool again because all of that NoSQL new stuff is built along conceptually identical models, only they've relaxed the ACID compliance they've relaxed the schema, the strict schema requirements, and they run in parallel. So they're able to run in distributed parallel environment. The three things you couldn't do back then. But other than that, they're very, very similar. So um, what we're getting pitched at now is these things are disruptive. Well, maybe they're disruptive, but I would argue that this is another marketing problem, and it's an information strategy problem and software market problem. Disruption is a bad frame. We should be talking about destabilization instead of disruption. Because what that disruption says is that I've got this thing, and this other thing's going to just blow it apart and destroy it. And so the X billion dollar Oracle market is going to be wiped out by choose your poison over here. Destabilizing would indicate that things aren't being replaced, they're being rearranged possibly. We've gone from something that was stable, which we've had for quite a while now, a relational database and applications market built around that stuff, but it's been teetering. Now it's been destabilized because there's a lot of great new technology that does things that we couldn't do before. And so you're going to rearrange a bunch of stuff. You're re-architecting. The big data revolution isn't purely about technology, it's about architecture. It's about how you arrange the components to do new things, bring some of the new bits in, get rid of some of the old bits, but most of the old bit is going to keep around. And that leads you to think about technology in a bad way. And when I say technology is additive and not transformative, what I'm talking about is not um, in sort of the basic sense, it's in the Marshall McLuhan, the median, medium is the message sense, or the medium is the massage, as he wrote later. It's, it's not that you get some new technology and you add it in, or you substitute it, you know, you subtract this one, you add the negative. Um, it's transformative. When you bring a technology in, any technology, it doesn't matter what it is, it could be, um, you know, you're out and gathering firewood, and it's going to change things. So you, um, you have the technology which changes the practices, which changes how you perceive the world, which is why I said I would talk about microscopes and telescopes today. So the scene in the 1500s is the geocentric world. This is the geocentric world. Um, we're talking about Aristotle and people uh, in that era saying the Earth is the center and everything revolves around us. It's all on spheres. It moves around in great circular orbits. And, oh, don't worry about some of those planets that seem to move forward across the sky and then go backwards and move forwards because of our parallax. Um, those are, are epicycles, and that's just that that thing is also going in a little circle like this once in a while. Um, Copernicus says those discrepancies are meaningful, and I think there's a better way that explains it without all of this crazy stuff. And based on the measurements that I have, it's that the sun's in the middle, and we're actually the third planet out. Fast forward a little bit to Galileo, the invention of the telescope, Galileo looks and sees a few things that totally destroy a lot of the old geocentric view and the Aristotelian view of the world, which is that Jupiter has moons. Things are orbiting around Jupiter. Things are orbiting around Jupiter. We're not the center of everything because Jupiter is the center of something. And he looks at the moon and he understands the effect of light on coarse textures, and that the patterns on the moon are actually caused by shadows on an irregular surface, not a perfect sphere. Oh, crap. So I thought I'd put this into a more familiar parlance for everybody. Um, I thought I would take this curve. I don't know why they call it the hype curve, because their vertical axis is visibility, which is just about the dumbest axis I could think of. But uh, we'll go with it. So telescope officially invented in 1608. Now, there was stuff going on before then. 1610, Jupiter has moons, oh my god! Copernicus publishes his book, 
around, you know, earlier than that time, of course, Galileo's working off it, and then the book gets banned. And so, um, you know, it's really getting up on the hype cycle. Kepler publishes his Rudolphine Tables. Uh, Galileo publishes his book. And that is the peak of the hype cycle, after which, a little while after, obviously 10 years, takes a while for things to get around, his book gets banned, actually got banned earlier than that, and he gets put under house arrest for the rest of his life, the first official trough of disillusionment. <laughs> then after this, of course, he publishes uh, a few other things, but he's still under house arrest, he dies under house arrest. Now, 50 years later, Newton comes along and works Kepler's laws out from first principles, and uh, you know, we're sort of out of that and we're back into adoption. We are not at the center of the universe. Things do move in ellipses. We're actually much smaller than we thought because those distances to get the planets where they need to be are so much greater that we're really tiny. And Newton's given us something that we didn't have before. He's given us universal law and variable data. If you think about what it meant to be in an Aristotelian world, you had universal law and universal data. The data didn't change. Things worked in perfect circles. Now they move in ellipses that speed up and slow down. And that's kind of a weird thing. Now, another scope I wanted to talk about was Anton von Leeuwenhoek. Leeuwenhoek was a, my, my uh, yeah, you know, a guy who works with microscopes. I can't pronounce words this early. That's actually the microscope he used. Um, or it's one of many microscopes he used. Now, that's a single lens microscope you take out of your pocket and you hold up to your eye like this. And yet, he made better microscopes than the compound microscopes that had been invented a hundred years before. He discovered how to make lenses. And he did this fairly late in his life. And he was able to see things nobody had ever seen before. You know, put a drop of blood on a slide. That's an actual picture taken here by somebody at the Royal Society of red blood cells. And you can even see a white blood cell. This is astonishing for a single lens microscope. And then he, he discovered all the crap by putting pond water on a slide, by looking at things and seeing cells. He discovered parasites. He discovered that spontaneous generation does not occur because he watched little tiny things reproduce and he never once saw spontaneous generation occur. He was a scientific badass, essentially. And um, we have a similar curve for him, of course, because all technologies should have one of these, because otherwise, how do you make money publishing? So, um, 1590, invention of, or, or, of the compound microscope. We move up the curve. Eventually, he publishes, but then something terrible happens. The Royal Society says, nobody else has seen this stuff. This guy must be insane. And so, of course, in 1676, they challenge him. He's in the trough of disillusionment. Now, the interesting thing is the, is the inverse, right? The inverse of what's going on with, with Newton. He manages to invert everything, and he goes to uh, some religious leaders who look through his microscopes and say, no, he's not insane, we see the same things. Unlike the... Uh, so the scientist appeals to the religious people for authority, where Galileo was trying to appeal to other scientists for authority. So, telescopes expanded our observable world, microscopes expanded the observable world in a different way, and everything allowed us to look deeper. And if we look at computing, computing, I would argue, is like a macroscope. It gives you the ability to take things and see connections, to see all sorts of other stuff. And our history has been over spans of decades. First, it was a calculating machine that spit out data. Then it was an automation machine. Then it was an information machine. And now we're talking about actuation. Most big data stuff is really about putting analytics and data into processes, into systems. It's not about data to eyeballs anymore, or only about data to eyeballs. It's about data to eyeballs and data to machines, and machines actually using patterns to act on other machines. And we're at this point where we're able to stitch together and see big pictures. And so we're seeing things that we didn't see before in pure reductionist science work. Now, I used to be a biologist a long time ago. You know, genes code for proteins. The number of genes means the complexity of the organism is, is going to be greater, blah, blah, blah. 
it turns out that activation sequences are a lot more important. And we find that networks and graphs and interconnections and interdependencies generate dynamic systems which generate emergent behaviors. That's the important stuff. So in fact, we just have a few more genes than a chicken and the grapes have us all beat. <laughs> now, with data it's the same problem. You know, a little bit of data goes a long way when you first give people data. After a while, they get used to it and it becomes the new normal. We build more complex systems on simpler systems until eventually we outstrip our own ability to comprehend complexity, and then we end up right back where we started. And that's part of what drives things. And so um, I'm going to skip over the decision theory bit on the, the uh, order of time, but just to say that complex adaptive systems and systems dynamics are the important thing today from a business use of data perspective. This is human eyeballs using data. This is not machine uses of data. But the technologies that you need to use it in a simple case, business intelligence, a complicated case like a car, or a complex case with nonlinear behaviors, an analytics problem. We're still learning how to do that now. Uh, we do the stuff on the left, the simple stuff, reporting and dashboards, okay, and we do the stuff in the middle, kind of varies. And so, when you look at the technology support for these things, what you're going to find, too, is that these contexts of decision-making are important because you have to use the right tool for the right job. You can't use reporting and dashboards to solve complex adaptive system problems because those are essentially A-B testing multivariate problems where you probe and figure out what's going on and then respond. You don't figure it out by just looking at it and then react and move on. And so complexity keeps cre you know, creeping up on us. And the scope thing, new observations create anomalies, change our understanding, that's in your head. That understanding changes how you do stuff changes your practices, those practices drive changes to your technology. Use changes the tech requirements and everything follows in a big circle. And so you go through periods of innovation, maturation, and saturation, and when you get over to the saturation side, everybody has it, there's no differentiation, and then things move back. So you're going from Six Sigma and lean techniques to optimize the efficient use of a, a resource to expanding possibility space in the area of innovation where you start, and these are two different things. Agile is all about that. Rapid iteration and exploration, Six Sigma is about trying to remove all of that variability from a system. And so you have to think about how you're acquiring technology, and what people are doing today is best practices. Let's find best practices with big data. Well, this sign says it best, survival bias. So survival bias is simply the fact that only the survivors get to tell you what they did. And the trailblazers who found the paths were the lucky ones. Everybody else died. And so if you emulate those guys and walk the same trail, maybe you'll be lucky or maybe it's just the wrong time of year. Now, all of those technologies are moving on different areas of the maturation curve. Big data is just starting out. We're at the very beginnings of this. The analytics bit has been climbing up for a while. The BI and data warehousing stuff is 25 years old this year, and so that's where we are. I wanted to use this slide just to show you where we are in the market. This shows the change of culture and practice. This is my LinkedIn connections. Last year, this slide had a big orange ellipse and a big blue ellipse, and they were separated with a few tenuous connections, one of them being me. Now, they're sort of half merged, and that orange ellipse has turned into a, an orange triangle and is kind of intertwingled there with the blue stuff. The blue stuff is all of the old data warehouse, BI, and database industry, and the orange stuff is all of the new guys. And what's happened here is that people have started to get connected, and you're seeing people with partnerships and customers in the old market coming from the new market. So, you can con draw two conclusions. If you're an optimist in the big data world, you're saying that this is like a bacteriophage that uh, Levon Hook has seen, and the orange stuff is invading that blue cell and is going to disrupt it from the inside, and then we're going to have all orange stuff. Or you could be the, uh, from the old school, living solidly on the downward side of that blue picture there, and you're viewing this as an amoeba eating that smaller, inferior cell, and you'll digest it and take its parts and intersperse them, and it will become Oracle X or something. So 
This is the state of the market we're in, and it's kind of fascinating that I've watched my connections do this. And so you do have two responses. Response number one, stick to what you know if you're one of the old school guys. Strap that NoSQL JSON bit to your bumper and keep on moving. Or you could use the new technology for everything if you're coming from the other side. And you could do everything in your favorite tool du jour. Maybe it's Hadoop and Hive. So I, I think that the middle road is the best. And you should really ask, what problem is the problem for which this technology is the answer? And how do I have these things coexist side by side so that I have the right tool for the right job? And with that, I believe I am out of time. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs>